Okay, family news. Good day. How are you all? You managed to get in before too much of the rain came down and soaked you. Leslie would always say, "Rain is good for the garden." The garden is very good at the moment. Although we do have some native irises out the front of our place and Leslie said that this is the greatest showing she's had. There's squillions of them there. It must be all the rain. But anyhow, welcome to you here in chapel. Welcome to you watching us via YouTube. Yes, so our first slide up there is talking about Tony. Uh, on holidays, comes back next week. They were at Threadbow. Yeah, lucky them. Now, that's a Triumph motorbike. You can't quite see on that photo the setting. Can I tell you, it's at the entrance to a church where they were made very welcome. Uh, Tony just seemed to have gravitated there. The motorbike, the leather jacket, you know, but he said he was made very welcome there. So that's wonderful. So, yes, welcome to you all. Do we know who that lady is? Yeah, she's not here today. She's sharing with us via YouTube. Teresa Plain, which is the name she used to have, palliative care pioneer and advocate. Former nurse Teresa Plain is recognised as a pioneer in modern palliative care in Australia. Her devotion began late one night during a drive home from hospital as she listened to a life-changing interview with psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. As she heard her discuss the five stages of dying, Teresa realised she'd always been a death-denying nurse. She was inspired to study palliative care methods overseas before opening a hospice and palliative care unit at Mount Carmel Hospital in Western Sydney in 1978. It's out at Seven Hills. It still stands. Teresa admitted patients on a needs basis rather than their ability to pay. She also launched a home care program supported by a charity she'd established to advocate on behalf of the dying. She later established Macquarie Hospice, a home care and daycare centre, and spoke many times at international forums, universities and national conferences. Those people are too small to activate the door. Can you go and press the green button, Margot? Thank you. There we are. Little ladies coming in very slowly. Don't activate the beam. <laughs> yeah, so Teresa has spoken many times at international forums, universities and national conferences. Why am I telling you this? It's a good question, isn't it? Teresa is one of the final nominees for New South Wales Senior Australian of the Year for 2023. The announcement will be made on the 2nd of November, so that's what, Tuesday week? Wednesday, Wednesday, at happy hour. So... We don't know what the outcome will be, but whatever the outcome, Teresa, congratulations on not just being nominated, but on all the incredible work that you have done and continue to do through your radio program at 2RPH, which is recorded in Studio 5 <laughs> to my right. Yes, congratulations. Friends, our call to worship today. God has called us as sons and daughters together, old and young alike. Let us rejoice in the many gifts God has provided. Friends, let us worship and praise God with all our might. Let's pray. Amazing God, we come to give you thanks for everything your people have received. May we feel the joy our ancestors felt at their vindication and restoration. Open us to your call to witness to your grace in the words and actions of our lives. Help us pray without pride or guile that we may receive the greatest gift of all, being in your presence forever and always. Amen.
Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Let's come before our Lord in prayer, friends. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the creator of the heavens and of the earth. You are the creator of all that we have, see and feel. It all comes from you. Father, at times we find it so difficult to imagine just how great you are to understand the magnitude of your power and influence. We have nothing against which we can compare your majesty. The great expanse of this earth is, well, it's but a small part of your wonderful creation, and we, we're just mere specks on its face. But Father, we know you have counted each speck. You know where we are. You know what we're doing. You know what's in our minds. Each day we learn more of your creation, either the physical and material things or just the wonders of each other. Lord, in your greatness, you make us so simple and yet so complex at the same time. And this is all part of the wonders and glory that can only come from you. Lord God, as we give you our thanks and praise, we ask you, your help to recognise these wonders, that we might continue to glorify your precious name, that our lives may be a true witness for others. Because, Father, you know there are times when we don't live our lives as you would have us. You know when we've strayed in thought, in word and in deed. We know, Lord, that we'll always be tempted to fall from your path, but we pray that you will give us strength courage and faith to resist that temptation. So for our weaknesses, we ask your forgiveness. And Lord, we know too, there are times when we've failed to love you with all our hearts or to be good stewards of your creation and, and all upon it. Most merciful and forgiving God, in penitence and faith, we confess our sins to you. Father, you do know our minds. You know that even now we're thinking of the wrongs we've done. So we pray for your forgiveness, that we may continue to walk in your ways, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, you've heard these words before. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hear then Christ's word of grace to each one of us when he says that our sins, your sins, are forgiven, to which we can say, thanks be to God. Uh, Tony and Malcolm will bring us our readings today. Thank you. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Psalms and Psalm 65. Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Saviour, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. This is the word of God. <clears throat> the reading from the New Testament is from Luke 18, 9 to 14. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. May God bless the reading of his word.
Doesn't Daphne come up with some brilliant backgrounds for all the things that go up on the screen? Aren't they beautiful? Okay, here we go, the gospel lesson for today. It's a familiar story, isn't it? About the Pharisee and the tax collector. As usual, Jesus uses a colourful contrast to gain our attention. Tax collector, hated by many, detested by most. And then the so-called religious Pharisee. It's easy to visualise the scene. The Pharisee, well, he looks very religious. He wears religious garments. He sounds religious. He does religious things. And he feels entitled to special treatment because of his religious position in society. He may even believe that God smiles upon him for being such a religious person. Then we have the other man, the tax collector. He could be wearing the very latest fashion and it wouldn't make one bit of difference in the way that people looked at him. No matter how hard he tries, he's not going to be well respected in the community. The obvious thing about this reading is that both men pray. The difference, of course, is in the way each man prays. One prays filled with pride and spirit. However, that spirit and pride is in himself. And the other, he prays with a sense of humility. When you look at this reading, you get a real sense that the tax collector is fully aware of his status, not only to the general public, but more importantly, to his standing before God. We all know that one of the primary ways that Jesus taught his disciples was to speak to them in parables. He was able to help them better understand these day-to-day -day livings through the use of these very colourful stories. And as always, neatly woven within these stories were the fundamentals of life that we all live with each day. Jesus, however, was able to weave these tales in a way that touched each life then and touches each life now. When we listen today with ears of faith, we're likely to find our own life within the life of the parable told by Jesus to his disciples so long ago. One thing that often finds its way into these stories is that there have always been those who place themselves on a much higher level than the rest of us. Sometimes even on a higher level than God, they think. In many ways, the ancient Pharisee was a religious icon. As a group, the Pharisees held sway over a great many people and institutions. Then and now, we must always be careful about who we put on a pedestal because it's likely they will fall from grace when the going gets tough. And in a direct parallel to our world today, the Pharisee stands in opposition to anyone who doesn't follow the party line. They were, in our common language today, fundamentalists. There was no room for any interpretation of the law unless by the scribes and that interpretation needed to meet with the approval of the Pharisees. Although they, like later Christians, believed in the resurrection of the dead, the similarities pretty much end at that point of agreement. Much like strong religious figures of our own time, the Pharisees and their scribes enjoyed a good deal of popular support. In one way, this is actually surprising since the Pharisees kept pretty much to themselves. They always seemed to be ready to criticise others for not keeping the laws and they, they often looked down on those who showed no interest in God's laws. Pharisees observed the law carefully as far as appearances went. But I think for many of them, their hearts were suspect. Their motives were questionable because they often wanted to heap praise upon themselves 
or at the very least have the appearance of holiness to all who would pay attention. As I said earlier, they very much mirror some of the stronger political and religious figures of our own time. Their voices were heard as authoritative and what they said had great influence in the society of that time. We see the same kind of power exhibited by religious figures in the Middle East today. One look at the news over recent years will tell you that the modern day Pharisees can incite violence or peace by a mere word. They can and often do use their positions for political and monetary gain. History tells us that the power of God in the hands of the self-centred was dangerous then and it is certainly dangerous today. People often raise questions about religious institutions. Why do denominations exist, they may ask. There are, of course, many answers to such a question, but one clear answer is summed up in one word, and that is accountability. Without accountability, we run the risk of becoming corrupt by our own sense of pride or arrogance. It really shouldn't be surprising to any person living in today's world that so many people believe that the only person they can trust is themselves. The Bible tells us to trust God. But somehow we manage to find flaws in that logic. When people heap praise only on themselves and don't recognise the activity of God in their lives, they become full of themselves. Full of themselves to the point of being in danger to themselves and even those around them. The idea that salvation can only come by our trust and faith in God leaves power-hungry people anxious and misguided. And anxious and misguided people are not likely to humble themselves even before the creator of all that is. Many have turned down the invitation because they, they fail to trust God. If you find that you've wandered down the wrong paths in life, if you'll carefully search your own past, as I exhort myself to do, you're likely to find a time when you trusted in yourself and not in God. Self-righteous people, self-righteous people like the Pharisees in our parable are likely to attack your character if you question what they say. Some within the Pharisaic community believed they were so holy, they were so holy that they felt they would become infected by the presence of others, just being in the same place. Most people, if they take the time to think about it, will discover that those people that are righteous in themselves do not live by the word of God, nor do they feel that they need it. These people have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. These people have rewritten God's laws of righteousness to fit their own lifestyles. Our world today glorifies those that proudly justify themselves. We see it all the time, don't we? We watch television shows that are geared to the success and riches that people have acquired by their own devices. <laughs> we even enjoy watching some of the rich and famous as they fall from grace because it seems to us that they probably deserve whatever bad thing is happening to them. What do we say in Australia? We've got that tall poppy syndrome even. And why do people enjoy watching such a thing? Well, they enjoy it because whether they admit it or not, they want what those people have. And if they can't have it, they enjoy watching them pay a high personal price for success. You know, it's funny, so many people reach for the stars. 
without ever giving serious consideration to who created the stars and put them in place. The success of advertising campaigns that promote so many things. They promote youth. You too can have this complexion. They promote all the, the sexual attitudes that are going on. They promote success and they point to a very basic problem in our world when they do this. There's nothing wrong with being attractive. Sorry, guys, not all of us are. There's not wrong with, nothing wrong with being youthful either. Have you finished giggling at me now? And there's nothing wrong with being rich. There is nothing wrong with being rich. There is, however, something terribly wrong when those attributes are used to the detriment of others. The problem for people who lift themselves above God, above the God that created them, is that they place themselves really in a no-win situation. The Bible for them becomes a book full of very nice stories, some wise tales that tells about a time long, long ago. Nothing more, nothing less. That's how some people look at the word of God. Now, I know someone out there is thinking that they don't fit this job description. They don't fall into this category. Well, let's take this discussion just a little bit further. If you take a close look at biblical history, you will find that there were at least three different kinds of Pharisees. There were what we can call the cultural Pharisees, those that just couldn't stand others because the others didn't look as good as they think they look. There were the societal Pharisees, those that looked down their noses and the only time they would help someone is when recognition was bestowed upon them, making them look superior to the one receiving the help. Then, of course, there were the intellectual Pharisees, those that thought they knew everything and that no other person could add anything to their knowledge that would increase their own intellectual ability. But, there's a word again, but before you get all comfortable, think that you don't fall into any of these categories, let us ask ourselves, let each one of us ask ourselves a few questions. Do you like the ability to correct others? Do you enjoy putting yourself in a position of superiority over others? Are you one of those who often see the wrongs in others, but (laughs) certainly not myself, please? Do you feel that you have to fix others, even if they don't think they need fixing? just because you think you can? Do you feel that you are closer to God than anyone else? Do you pray to glorify God? Or do you pray to glorify yourself? Do you want recognition for everything you do? Do you have a tendency to criticise others no matter what the situation? Now, I've said you. I now reread it and I put me in there. You might have listened to that and thought, do I? So just in case there are some Pharisees here this morning, I want you to know that Pharisees, tax collectors... And the rest of us can be redeemed. The message for us today 
is that Jesus will hear our prayers and he will make our lives worthy of his attention. Jesus can take you. Jesus can mould you into the instrument of love you were meant to be. He's already set the example and has allowed us a peek of what it is we are to be. He has allowed us to understand how it is we are to live life and why we are to live it for him. This is good news. Is it not good news? It is. We all need to remember the simplicity of the prayer the tax collector offered that day. Wasn't verbose. Didn't take all day. Didn't do it out in the middle. He said simply, God, be merciful to me. You see, the important thing about this parable is to see the position the tax collector places himself in. He puts himself in a posture of contrition, a posture of repentance, a posture of sorrow. It's a position with which most are unfamiliar. When Malcolm was reading this, did you have any vision in your mind about what these two men were doing? Did you envisage this poor tax collector stuck in a corner? Did you see him down in this position? What about the Pharisee? Unlike the tax collector, he understands that he's in danger of putting himself in a place of divine displeasure. And in order to close the gap he perceives between himself and God, he throws himself into God's everlasting arms. This is what our tax collector does. He is not like the Pharisee, the religious one. He wants to close that gap that he thinks there is. He wants to throw himself into the everlasting, ever-loving arms of God. The message seems clear for those who will hear it. Those everlasting arms, those ever-loving arms will not let you go. Not now, not ever. You know, we all need to take the I out of our prayers and put in the you. Remember the closing verse of our gospel lesson for today had these words. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. But all who humble themselves will be exalted. May we be the exalted of God. Amen. Our next hymn is when I survey that wondrous cross, during which time your free will offering will be received. <coughs>
Let's pray. Loving Father God, we're so grateful that you name and claim us as your beloved ones. We thank you with all our hearts for the cleansing rain in our souls. And so we offer you what we have our resources, our time, our energy, our very selves. All this we offer you for your ministry in the world. Amen. Grace is going to lead us in prayer. Good morning. I must say at the beginning how much I've enjoyed the music today. Haven't the hymns been lovely? You're great. Lovely choir too. Lord and Heavenly Father, you have brought us safely to this day. Keep us by your mighty power. Protect us from sin and guard us from every danger. We thank you for the fellowship of this community in this place where we feel your love. We pray for the peace of the world and we ask for your intervention for the peoples who fight tyranny and invade us on their land. Shine your light on us, Lord, and lead us away from the darkness of war and disease. Our heartfelt prayers are for the welfare and rescue of the many in this country who are experiencing flooding. Please, Lord, we pray that you will assist those facing loss of homes, stock and income from properties. We are glad to know of the community spirit which is alive and well in these many districts where, along with the SES and ADF, people of good heart are fighting back the encroaching waters. Thank you for the many volunteers who are caring for those in need. Comfort and heal all who live in sickness, pain, sorrow or fear. We lift to you Joyce Kempthorne, Ray Green, Nina Ferguson, Janet Edwards and family. We think of the loved ones of those whose funerals have recently been held in this chapel. For those who suffer but are not named here, we beg for your loving care and peace. We are glad that Yvonne Kuno is feeling a little stronger also that Brenda Hawkins is now resident in Phyllis Stewart Nursing Home. We give thanks for all community leaders who serve the common good, give wisdom to those who have responsibility and authority at all levels of government. We ask for your blessing on medical and allied services. Keep them strong and safe. Here in our village home, we ask you to bless the staff particularly those new to their positions, grant that they have the will, understanding and commitment to work su successfully in the fields of retirement living and nursing care. We are grateful for the efforts of all those who work to make our lives healthy, comfortable and happy. We pray that those in management be aware of the need for nursing management in the evening of our lives. How proud we are to hear of Teresa Howe's nomination for New South Wales Senior Australian of the Year. Well done, Teresa. Please empower your ministers, Tony and Bob, with the heart and strength to shepherd your flock. Keep them safe. Bring Tony and Gina home safely from their leave. We hope that they have had an enjoyable time. For those off on holiday, we wish them rest and renewal and compare them, commend them to your care and safe return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things we do in our care homes each week when we're able to get to them, and it's wonderful that Connie Fall is finally out of its second lockdown in the last month. Well, Rod's here today, so they must be okay. 
It's good that Rod can come and share with us. One of the things we always do, we do pray for the staff because there are a lot of staff that we see around the place. There's a lot of staff that we don't see around the place too. But each one of them does so much. You know, we, we go into the care homes. You see the admin people there, of course. You see the nurses moving around. You see the, the carers and the, and the rec officers. What we don't always see are the people who are out there cleaning rooms. We don't see the people who are setting the tables or clearing away the tables, preparing the meals, doing all those unseen jobs which need to be done. Because when they're not, someone says, oh, that didn't get done. Who does that? We don't know because there are so many unseen people. So it is important, and thank you for praying for all the staff. Because they're pretty short on the ground at the moment too. Uh, we do have agency staff come in, but the agencies don't have a lot of staff to send. So it is important that we uphold all of the incredible staff, particularly in the care homes, but all the others as well. Because as you prayed, they make our lives so much easier here. Would you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Let us pray that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So friends, today, go forth without shame to proclaim the goodness of God. Go forth to spread God's love with all, giving thanks for how much you are loved. Go forth knowing that the wind of the Spirit blows you to where you need to be. Go with the blessing of God the Father. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit being upon each and every one of you now and always. Amen. Amen. This life I live